Good afternoon, my fellow believers. I am Dr. Tammy Prince, the nation's bedside doctor, and you are listening to Health Tips with the nation's bedside doctor. On this show, we have real talk about real issues that affects our communities every single day. If you've missed any of um, my shows, have no fear. They were great topics. I want you to receive them. You can go to our YouTube um, channel, 108 Praise Radio is what you're going to search, and you can find all of my um, replays of my show so that you can be in the know. Um, I just want to take the time out to celebrate the fact that 108 Praise Radio, under the, excuse me, under the direction of Courtney Clark, has won Internet Station of the Year. Let me show you our little award that we got from um, the Praise Factor Awards. It was a complete surprise to all of us. Um, And, you know, it just really solidifies why we are here doing what we do. I am so honored and blessed to be a part of this wonderful family. And um, I just look forward to many more successes uh, that we have as a radio station. I am claiming it. We are going to be number one worldwide. You know, I pray that all of you have had a great and blessed day. I actually woke up this morning, and I felt really refreshed and ready to, you know, get my day started. I didn't even need to wake up to an alarm clock. Um, I just, you know, maybe I was excited because I knew I was coming on and speaking with each of you and, and giving you little tidbits of medical knowledge that I think that you need to know. Today's topic is a very important one is one that's near and dear to me. It's actually sickle cell um, disease month and I want to discuss sickle cell disease. You know, I will let you know later in the show why this is so near and dear to me. Um, But one of the things is most people have heard of sickle cell disease, but they don't actually know what it is. So I want to take the time uh, now before I introduce my uh, first guest to kind of give some background on sickle cell disease. Sickle cell is a group of inherited red blood cell disorders that affects about 100,000 Americans, vast majority being um, Americans of African descent. There are several different types of sickle cell disease. We'll get into that a little bit later uh, in the show. But in all the types, at least one of two abnormal genes causes a person's body to make hemoglobin S. That S stands for sickle. Now, normally red blood cells are shaped like discs and they're very flexible. That allows for them to be able to go through all the large and small blood vessels without any issues, supplying oxygen to our tissues and all of our organs. But in sickle cell disease, that's not the case. These sickled cells are actually hard. They're rigid and they cause blockage in these blood vessels. When the blood vessels get blocked, guess what? Oxygen can't get to your organs or your tissues. And that's where we have what we call pain crisis in sickle cell patients. And if you've never ever experienced this kind of pain before, you have no idea. This pain is unreal. And, you know, it causes these patients to have to go to the hospital for treatment. Some patients know how to manage it um, at home themselves, but for the most part, it actually does require hospitalization. In these kind of cells, um, the cells only last for about 10 to 20 days. Now normally, normal red blood cells last about 120 days, so you see the difference. There's a wide difference between 10 to 20 days that your um, blood has to replenish versus 120 days. So in sickle cell disease, the body can't keep up with this fast pace of destruction and replenishing the blood supply, so that causes anemia. One statistic that I think is important to know is the difference between sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. So one in 13 African-American babies will be born with the trait. One in 365 African-American babies will be born with a disease. So you see, there's more people that are born with the trait than with the disease. 
We'll discuss a little bit later why that is. Usually, um, persons of ethnic backgrounds such as African descent, Hispanic descent, Asian, um, Indian descent, Middle Eastern, and South European um, have a high propensity for sickle cell disease. I want to bring on my guest, Dr. Milford Green, who is the director of the Health and Clinical Services at Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to read a little bit of his bio if you can. I'm so impressed with Dr. Green. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in biology from Morehouse College, his PhD degree in biology from Wellesleyan University, and his Master's of Public Health degree from the Harvard University School of Public Health. Dr. Green was the first diversity dean and a member of the faculty in biochemistry and community medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Green has previously served as assistant dean of admissions and student affairs and assistant professor of community medicine and family practice at Morehouse School of Medicine. He has held teaching and staff positions at other institutions such as Cornell University where he was an associate dean. Dr. Green resides here in Atlanta, Georgia, which is why he's able to be with me in person and live today. I appreciate him being here. How it's are a, you doing? It's a delight to be here, Dr. <laughs> Green. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Well, Dr. Green, you heard some of the um, statistics that I was uh, throwing out. Would you like to expand on anything? Well, I could amplify uh, with respect to what was actually happening here in Georgia. Of course, you said that there are uh, well in excess of 100,000 people in this country who, are, uh, who, who have this disease. But in Georgia, we have probably at least 9,000 people who actually have this disease. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we've done a number of studies, uh, one called the RUSH study. Uh, it's a registry study uh, done in association with a number of institutions, mm -hmm. the lead institution of Georgia State University. Mm -hmm. We were involved at the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia, but there are a number of other institutions that were involved. Of course, this was done with uh, funding from the Centers for Disease Control, but mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line is that we've now found out that there's at least about, uh, we the, the numbers have, have increased a little bit since the study. Uh, at the time of the study was about 7,000 people, a little over 7,000 people, but we know that that number is pretty, pretty, uh, much higher than that. Mm -hmm. It's probably somewhere like 10, uh, eight, eight, eight to, I would say 9,000 people who have the disease in the state. Um, that, uh, as you pointed out, the, the, the numbers of individuals who carry the the trait are much, much higher than that. If we look at the 100,000 people, for example, in the country, we probably have somewhere between two and five million people who actually carry the sickle cell trait. Mm -hmm. So the allele, or if we call it an allele, that's what an individual carries if they carry the trait. The allele uh, predisposes, you know, the, the chances that we will have a sickle cell child if two individuals have the, who have the trait uh, mm -hmm. happen to have a child. Mm -hmm. And every time they have a child, there is a chance that they, 25% chance that the child will have sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be amazing how often it does happen. Yeah, and um, I know I was telling you um, before we began the show, but um, why sickle cell is so near and dear to me is the fact that I actually have the trait. And I remember growing up, my dad um, always telling me, be careful who you marry. You got to know who you marry. And I didn't know at the time, you know, why he was saying what he was saying. But what he told me in later years was, you have the trait. You have to make sure that you don't marry somebody with the trait so that you don't have a child with the disease. Now, we don't know if anybody in the family that actually has the disease. Um, most of us do have the trait. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to trace it to... Um, one side of my dad's family. We knew that my mom didn't have it. And I actually asked my mom, because I said, you know, when did you find out that I had it? And she said that I was a baby. So usually, nowadays, we actually test oh, absolutely. the yes. woman mm -hmm. while she's pregnant, or even before she's pregnant, to see if she has the trait. And then if she does, then we will test the father of the baby to see if he also has the trait. But back 
when I was born, I'm not telling you when I was born. I, have, I, I, I actually know. I actually have an idea when you were born. In fact, I had a daughter born about three years before you were that's born. That's right. That's and, right. And uh, one of the last things that they did is we were leaving the hospital. They had forgotten to do this, and this was uh, quite a while back in, in New England. They actually pricked her foot there to determine if she uh, carried the trait. Mm -hmm. So uh, it actually turned out she didn't, but I understood what was going on. But that mm -hmm. was quite a while ago. It took, a, took quite a while before this became a national testing program in this country. Yeah. My mm -hmm. parents don't remember me being pricked in the hospital. I very well could have been. Mm -hmm. But she remembers at, like, maybe my first or my second well check appointment that um, the blood work did show that I had sickle cell traits. So then my parents had to go through testing to figure out what side of the family it came from. And like I said, we narrowed it down to my dad and his mother's side of the family. I think it's extremely important to point out to, to, to your audience that um, th this is a national program. It's called the Newborn Screening Program. And sickle cell disease is one of several uh, uh, genetic diseases that uh, are being screened here. So we should know, but the fact of the matter is that information is not always passed on in families, mm -hmm. and many people are still um, knowledge, knowledgeable with respect to their, uh, their status with this, uh, this trait, and, and they'll know that they have the disease because that's going to be done. They'll, they'll, the, the disease is going to manifest itself at about mm -hmm. five months mm -hmm. regardless, but if you have the trait, that information awfully gets buried mm -hmm. uh, or lost. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you mentioned that it'll manifest and we'll know about it. What are some of the signs and symptoms that um, may appear? Well, well certainly, the, the, as I like to say, the hallmark of this disease mm -hmm. is pain. Mm -hmm. uh, so pain is going to generally uh, be experienced by the individual mm -hmm. uh, simply because, as you say, the beautiful biconcave disc of a red blood cell simply gets through the capillaries especially uh, very easy, mm -hmm. whereas the sickled cell that's shaped like a, a moon, an, an early moon, mm -hmm. is going to have great difficulty getting through those small vessels, and mm -hmm. that produces pain. And, of course, uh, there are other symptoms that uh, accompany it over time. There's uh, splenic pro spleen problems. Um, mm -hmm. There is, uh, you know, there are all sorts of physical, out, out, outward physical uh, problems with uh, hands mm -hmm. and fingers. Um, uh, you'll see, um, on, on occasion, you'll see uh, the kind of uh, ulcer ulcerated sores. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, you know when a person has sickle cell, they're mm -hmm. sick. Mm -hmm. uh, something is really wrong. And quickly, these individuals are tested uh, if they haven't, if they don't know the, the status. They're tested, and it, it'll tell you quickly that they have uh, sickle cell disease. Yeah, I know. Um, because it affects every single organ and tissue in your body, um, yes. you can just imagine what types of symptoms. One thing that I uh, want to point out, too, is in men, you can have um, it affect your penis, and you can have something called priapism. Priapism, yes. You want to talk uh, about priapism? <laughs> well, it, it, it is just a, a very, very difficult and, mm -hmm. and uncomfortable uh, state uh, for a man, and, mm -hmm. and priapism is simply an erection that won't go away, mm -hmm. and it uh, produces a great deal of pain for mm -hmm. the individual who, who uh, has, has that problem. Yeah. These, uh, y you can't get the blood out of the penis actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that actually turns into a, a medical emergency oh, absolutely. Um, if that happens uh, yeah. because you can lose the function of your penis yes. if that happens. So um, that definitely needs to be taken care of uh, immediately. Absolutely. Now, um, I wanted to talk to you about the different types of uh, sickle cell disease. There are many types um, of the sickle cell. Well, there you know, being very honest, there are, there are more than a thousand variants mm -hmm. of, of the sickle, uh, of, of the actually the hemoglobin molecule. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the variation or the uh, mutation, if you will, occurs in that molecule. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, as, a, as you say, a person can get the sickle cell um, trait from two different parents. And if that happens, they are going to have the sickle um, SS, as we call it, disease. But there are other uh, there are other combinations, uh, S beta thalassemia, uh, there's S sickle C, there are a, no a number of them that mm -hmm. actually, uh, they cause, you know, in some cases almost as much problem as sickle cell uh, anemia, 
but in some cases they are not as um, they're not quite as uh, difficult to deal with. But mm -hmm. there's more than one, which is why we call it sickle cell disease. At one time we only spoke of sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. but uh, there are there are other combinations of it. But simply, uh, it's simple to test for it. Uh, to, to go into, um, you actually could come to our, our sickle cell lab at the um, Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia. Mm -hmm. We test for these uh, hemoglobinopathies, we call them. Uh, we do this every day. So if anybody is in need of a test and you don't know your, your status, we encourage you mm -hmm. to uh, make an appointment, and you can do this by going online at our website, uh, sicklecellga.org. So it's very mm -hmm. simple to do that, and there are other ways to get well, We actually do it on a sliding scale so that uh, it may or may not cost you money to, mm -hmm. to actually have the disease. So we do encourage mm -hmm. people to come and determine if you have any inkling, if you, there's any question mark, if you don't know your status, mm -hmm. get tested anyway. Certainly, if you are of childbearing age, you're thinking of having children, you're in a committed relationship, those kinds of things, those are the individuals that we strongly encourage uh, mm -hmm. to, to do that. And we have, uh, there, there, there's actually um, yeah, legislation that encourages it around the state. We have in all the magistrate courts, we, we have uh, information that uh, we give out to individuals so that um, if they are of childbearing age, mm -hmm. there, there's a strong encouragement to, uh, to come in and, and be tested. Mm -hmm. And we have a partnership with, an, uh, with a major tester uh, in LabCorp so that if you're in Georgia uh, and you have an interest in getting a test, you can actually go to a LabCorp site or go online and, and find a LabCorp site, have your, your blood uh, uh, drawn, and it'll then go to LabCorp, and the information will be uh, sent to us, and we will then be in touch with you to, to let you know the outcome. And if you need any kind of counsel mm -hmm. during that process, we will. We have genetic counselors, mm -hmm. people who can talk to you about uh, the disease and what how you have to deal with yourself from that point on. Oh wow! I don't think yes. I um, I realized that you know uh, you all had that partnership not only with um, a lab but also through the courts. Yes. You know, um, most most of the time you think that you just have to go to your doctor, <laughs> you know, to have this done. But it's good to see well, the that there are other resources that are out there. You don't just have to go to your doctor. You can go to Sickle Cell um, Foundation yes. and uh, get this done. What would the maximum cost be? I know you talked about a sliding scale, but what would the max be? Uh, the maximum in our location Right now is forty dollars. It's mm -hmm. about to it's about to go up a little, but mm -hmm. it, we, we're talking about probably a third of the real cost mm -hmm. at, at another kind of facility. Mm -hmm. So we do this at uh, and again, uh, in many cases we're doing this uh, because we raise money from other uh, other ways to try to offset the cost of it mm -hmm. for people who cannot afford it. But we want people to know there their uh, status with respect to the trait. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's $40 mm -hmm. well spent. Yes, you know, oh, absolutely. Um, considering the fact that you can have a child with a disease if you don't know, and then you'll be spending a lot more money trying yes. to take care and, and manage that child. This is a disease where if it, there may be an individual who has a disease, but it's a family disease. Everybody mm -hmm. is sick mm -hmm. in that family, not literally, figuratively mm -hmm. speaking, but mm -hmm. everybody's focus is on that child mm -hmm. who has the disease. So you really need to have the information so that you can make an informed decision mm -hmm. about having children. We don't tell anybody what to do. We mm -hmm. simply make sure that you have the information so that your decisions mm -hmm. are informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Be in the know. Be in the know. Mm -hmm. Be in the know. Absolutely. You gotta know what your status is. That's why they is. should be listening to you That's right. and looking at you because they need to be in the know. And this is a show that brings you into the know. Well, I appreciate that. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Now tell me this, why are some ethnic groups having a higher incidence of sickle cell disease? We talked about that a little bit. Well, you, you really have to go back uh, to where this disease started. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about beginnings and starts, it seems that all things begin on the continent, mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. the mother continent. That <laughs> is Africa. Mesopotamia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the mother continent. So 
Uh, yes, this is a mutation which took place on, uh, you know, on the savannas of Africa m a long, long time ago. Probably, I mean, there's actual research that indicates this is about 7,000 years ago when this, uh, this actual mutation occurred. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into the story of that because it's a special story in and of itself, but it did take place. And that mutation has been passed on uh, over many uh, hundreds of years, uh, like I say, as, as long as 7,000 years ago. And today we have millions of people worldwide who have this disease. And it's mm -hmm. actually, I mean, it's actually uh, suggested that by the year 2050, there may be as many as 400 million people in the wow. world with this disease. So we're talking about a very serious uh, disease where a lot of people are very, very sick. Wow, that's a big number. Absolutely, it's incredible. And to think that sickle cell disease is not talked about, and is that many people that are affected? Yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's, we can go to places, uh, uh, parts of uh, Africa, without calling specific names, there are parts of Africa mm -hmm. where the allele, of, uh, the, the percentage of the allele in the population is um, mm -hmm. uh, better than 40%. That's mm -hmm. almost one in two people carrying uh, the actual mm -hmm. uh, sickle cell trait. Mm -hmm. And with that kind of a frequency, it's almost a certainty that you're going to have a very, very significant num number of people with the actual disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. I call it survival of the fittest. Actually, it, it, um, it is. It's I kind mean, of protective. Sense, yeah, it, the, most people probably don't understand this, but from an evolutionary perspective, the actual the sickle cell trait is is a protective mutation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it in 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 parts of the world where you find the the sickle cell trait in high percentage it almost it, in uh, it's like a super in imposition if you're looking at a map of places where there was endemic malaria mm -hmm. so there's that peculiar relationship between malaria and sickle cell disease mm -hmm. but in a population where you have both malaria and sickle cell disease mm -hmm. and people who have the trait it turns out that the people who have the trait survive better than either the people with sickle cell disease mm -hmm. or the people who get malaria. Mm -hmm. It has a protective effort. I mean, it, it has a protective effect. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I always like to say, you know, in a in a malarial world, in a Zika world, uh, I, I I I mean, I don't mean to say Zika really, but in a malarial world, and we never know when that could happen again. Mm -hmm given global warming, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that there are diseases that just seem to um, proliferate uh, in warm climates. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really be careful. And, and if we think about it, we relaxed our efforts worldwide mm -hmm. uh, on, on uh, control of malaria. That's mm -hmm. another real problem. Yeah, I think you, Zika yes. took over and then all yeah. of a sudden you kind of forgot about malaria, but malaria, malaria still is serious. A million and people maybe. I know I travel all over the world mm -hmm. and even though I have the sickle cell trait, I still actually take the anti-malarial medicines Absolutely. Uh, when I go into endemic countries. I don't really want to test <laughs> my yeah. trait out. Um, now, I, 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 I wouldn't recommend that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you, you really have to, uh, you have to really be careful. And, uh, and like I say, there's still, you know, roughly a million people who are dying each year in the world from malaria. So it's still a serious disease, and we need to redouble our efforts in that regard as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, tell me about the work that you do with the Sickle Cell well, Foundation it, of Georgia. You know, as I say, I, I'm, a, I'm a former administrator and uh, professor in, in uh, UNI. In, in three U.S. medical schools. Mm -hmm. And so I was always involved in, in the teaching of things that related to it, mostly the biochemistry and also mm -hmm. my public health background, looking at the infectious disease, malaria, and how it accompanies uh, this, this, the sickle cell disease. So after teaching for so many years and uh, having uh, taught public health and medical students around the country over a period of you know, the, my, my professional life, um, I thought it was high time for me to get involved uh, in sickle cell disease at, at the level of the people, per, per, per se. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I, this disease, yes, we do research. Yes, mm -hmm. we treat it clinically. 
but how do we deal with the people who have the disease? Mm -hmm. And that's where the Sickle Cell Foundation has made such a, a, a powerful impact on the community. Our programmatic efforts, the things that we do for the people who have this disease, for the people whose people's families uh, who have this disease, uh, that's where uh, this organization has shown. Mm -hmm. This organization was started by two physicians, uh, Dr. Nelson McGee, Jr., and Dr. Duluth King, who's still living. Um, this was back, uh, you know, almost 40 years, a uh, little over 40 years ago. This, uh, this foundation was founded because there was so little and so much misinformation in the community, and not only in, among pe just, just the, you know, the community and the people in the community, but it was that case among the, the providers in the community. Doctors simply mm -hmm. didn't know a great deal about it. Mm -hmm. Today, doctors simply still don't know a great deal Why about this that disease. Is? Well, we, are, we live in a world of specialty, Mm -hmm. And if, if one uh, doesn't choose to do perhaps hematology, uh, which is where the specialists are, if you don't do a specialty in hematology, then you are going to know your specialty and you're not going to want to treat people the way you don't have a real specialty. Mm -hmm. And the numbers on a per capita basis are, you know, horrific in terms of the numbers of hematologists that we have per, uh, you know, the people mm -hmm. uh, in the population. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably the, 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 one of the biggest problems that we have. So one of the things that we have done programmatically about that is that we offer, in association with the Mohau School of Medicine, a CME, which is a continuing medical education mm -hmm. course. It's as a provider course. It's for physicians, it's for nurses and people in public health, uh, mm -hmm. all across the spectrum of providers. And what we do is we present this course around the state of Georgia. More recently, we have gone to Swainsboro, Georgia, which is uh, Emanuel County. Mm -hmm. And Emanuel, uh, that county uh, health department uh, deals with several other counties. Mm -hmm. So when we do that course, we're, we're giving information to people uh, in Georgia in all of those counties. We did it in Macon. We had several counties involved there. So we bring physicians in, we bring nurses in, and especially the nurses because the nurses are front line on this thing, uh, especially at the, at the health departments. So we bring them in and we teach them as much as we can about this disease. And we have some highly recognized hematologists who work with us in that regard. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes. And um, just, you know, FYI, hematologist is a physician that um, specializes in diseases of the blood. And that's the doctor that a sickle cell patient will need to see. Not just a primary care specialist, but an actual hematologist. Yeah, I want to stress the fact that, you know, you need primary care mm -hmm. physicians. Everybody should have a primary mm -hmm. care. If you utilize the system of medicine in this country, the way it's set up, mm -hmm. you should be referred to your hematologist. Mm -hmm. And once you refer to that hematologist, you stay with them. Mm -hmm. But you really need to care for some other things mm -hmm. that the hematologist is not going to mm -hmm. be focused on, and the primary care physician is mm -hmm. best Oh, absolutely. That. Absolutely. The primary care mm -hmm. physician is your gatekeeper, but mm -hmm. the hematologist is the one that is going to manage Absolutely. that sickle cell disease mm -hmm. and not necessarily your primary doctor. They'll yeah. work hand in hand, but the hematologist is going to take the lead on that one. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Now, um, you know, we mentioned some of the signs and symptoms of yeah. sickle cell. Mm -hmm. um, fever is actually a medical emergency. Oh, Why yeah. is that? Well, fever, <laughs> you, you don't want to, you don't want a fever because mm -hmm. it can send you into, um, you know, it, it can kill you quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, and past a certain point, you really need, no matter mm -hmm. what kind of, uh, what you have a fever from, mm -hmm. you need to address a fever very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, in sickle cell, um, you don't have um, a very good immune system. No. And you can't really fight off the infections the way that you would in somebody who does not have the disease. And there is a compromise, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we have to teach people very quickly and early on, especially when they have uh, left uh, what we call uh, uh, pediatric care and they're in adult care, 
we lose so many of the people at, that, at those ages. That is that transition age where they're teenagers and going into adult care. Mm -hmm. They don't care for themselves as well as they were cared for by family and physicians early on. You're well cared for in those early years mm -hmm. by the system itself. I mean, uh, there, there's a system of health care in this country that's, uh, it's, it's, it has, it's well paid for, it's well financed by the country, and we have major organizations uh, without calling names, we have major organizations mm -hmm. that are taking care of those individuals, children. Mm -hmm. But as they go from pediatric to adult care, there is a kind of abyss mm -hmm. uh, into which those individuals drop. And without the care and the, and the, the wraparound of the community and family, we lose very many mm -hmm. of them because they tend to want to do the things that they haven't done and the things that They're teenagers. Young, young people are <laughs> doing. Young. Right? They want to run. They want to mm -hmm. enjoy life. Mm -hmm. But it can be consequential when mm -hmm. they do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like the theme is be proactive. Absolutely. <laughs> you got to stay on top of it. Just because, you know, you um, age out of your pediatrician doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you age out of this disease. There's no aging out of this disease. And, and so often individuals don't have the proper insurances mm -hmm. to get the care that they should be getting in this country. Mm -hmm. And so without that care, they're really in a no as I hate to put it, a no man's kind of mm -hmm. land that you don't want to be. You need you need a system around you mm -hmm. in, with this disease. Are there any programs for people that cannot afford mm -hmm. to see a specialist well, if, if they don't have if, medical care? Yes, if, if they can qualify for Medicaid, mm -hmm. that is probably the best case scenario for them. Mm -hmm. um, it, but you really, to qualify for, for Medicaid, in today's uh, health market, you really have to be pretty poor, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And there's so many situations where they just won't allow you to, to qualify. So it is not the best case scenario for a person who is going into adult care mm -hmm. from pediatric care with this disease. Mm -hmm. Is this something that the Sickle Cell uh, Foundation of Georgia can assist with if a person called? Um, to speak to someone, would they be able to get um, the resources uh, to be able to? Uh, An excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the answer to your question is yes. But let me tell you how we actually are doing that around the state. Mm -hmm. We now have uh, several offices that are addressing the problems of sickle cell individuals around the state. And we're doing this through what is called our community health worker program mm -hmm. so that we actually have uh, young people who are community health workers, and they're not all young people, but these people are going into the community. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is not only identifying individuals with the disease, and many people just don't want to be bothered. They, you know, you, you have to go find them sometimes. But what they're doing is uh, taking these individuals by the hand and making sure that all of these resources in the community are available to them. They are taking them to hematologists and making mm -hmm. sure that they get care. They are doing very simplistic things like making sure that they are uh, going to their appointments on time. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that the community health worker drives for the life of an individual. So that's one of the best ways to do it. And, and they can also get you in, in the direction of insurances mm -hmm. and other kinds of programmatic things mm -hmm. that uh, are going to help you. We. Um, we have all kinds of little efforts. I mean, efforts to make sure that uh, people are getting the food that they necessarily need. Mm -hmm. We have a SNAP program. That's a su supplemental nutrition uh, mm -hmm. program uh, that is run by the federal government. We should call it food stamps, but we make sure that individuals who qualify for that mm -hmm. actually are getting the right foods that they need. And mm -hmm. food is essential. The right mm -hmm. foods is essential to anybody who has any kind of compromise of the immune system or any kind of a health problem. Mm -hmm. So certainly sickle cell disease is one of those. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what about the churches? Have you all been able to um, partner with churches to see how the churches can help 
Absolutely. We are actually, uh, I have uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks gone to about three churches myself. Yes, we actually, we do things like, for example, I spoke at St. John Missionary Baptist Church, which is uh, in southwest Atlanta. I spoke uh, recently there to them. They have what is called a, a noon Bible study. Mm -hmm. So we take, any we take any advantage we can of having an opportunity to have uh, a, a dialogue with people in the church. Um, we encourage, um, we, we had a big health fair at one of the, uh, one of the churches. I mean, churches actually hold many health fairs, so we always are present at those health fairs. And in some cases, the churches will have uh, a kind of health ministry. And so we are involved with churches in that way. There's a kind of partnership, yes. Mm -hmm. And I could call the names of several churches, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, it, just to make a long story short, yes, we have partnered with churches mm -hmm. in the community. Uh, we actually uh, were working with churches this month during Sickle Cell Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And I want to stress the fact that this is Sickle Cell mm -hmm. Awareness Month. September. Mm -hmm. Every year is Sickle Cell Awareness Month. It does month. not change. It doesn't change. And so what we are doing, we've done, is to actually impose upon churches to mm -hmm. actually do their own programs mm -hmm. uh, that are related to, uh, to sickle cell and its awareness and, and the kind of information. So we'll go to those churches, and we have many of our staff people who are out there all the time, especially during this month. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, we're going to take a little break for a minute, but when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about how patients can manage their pain. Yes. That's important. So we'll be back shortly. We got to pay some bills. Your future will be greater than the past A lot of people going through some pain of the past Don't know what to do A lot of people going through some stress Can see their whole way through I've got some motivation for you Preferably it will help you out Listen, apply to your life Trust and don't Keep on looking in the past Just keep on pressing forward Fearless Your future will be greater than the past The life you live some years from now It is what you do in life right now So be careful what you do today Cause you reap what you sow in a mighty big way just the love in all your heart Acknowledge him and he will direct your path Let wisdom be your best friend So when the day ends Your future will be greater than the last Once you don't keep on looking in the past Just keep on pressing forward Fearless Your future will be greater Just want to see you smile, they want to see you frown, no Put away fear, put away anxiety, keep the faith, trust in the Almighty No matter what people say or do, no matter what you're going through Keep your eyes, keep your eyes, focus on the prize You can win
Dr. Milford Green from Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia. We are having such a great conversation about sickle cell, and hopefully you're getting in the know because you need to know your status, right? Absolutely. That's, that is the whole theme, and the whole takeaway yes. of this show is to make sure you know what's going on with you. Yeah, one would have to read volumes just to get an iota of the the information that we've imparted here uh, today. It, it, it takes a lot of reading to know this. Mm -hmm. So if you listen up, you're going to get a lot of information, which is very, very helpful. And the work that the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia does, I mean, it's amazing work. If you need the resources, please do not hesitate to reach out to them. That's what they are there for. Absolutely, I agree. Yes. Now, um, I mentioned about uh, some of the um, symptoms and, and pain obviously is a hallmark um, of, the, um, of the disease. How do you manage? Well, you know, it, 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 depend, it depends upon the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, m most people don't realize that they, they, every person is different. Mm -hmm. and, and so if, if pain is the real problem, then there, there are drugs, of course, that uh, can help you. Mm -hmm. There are some people who have to have uh, blood transfusions mm -hmm. uh, al almost on what we call a chronic basis. That is, mm -hmm. they, in some cases, may have as many as 12 uh, transfusions a year. Of course, that carries with it some risks. Mm -hmm. uh, b blood is, is, is I mean, it, if you're sick with a crisis, you're sick in a crisis, and you get an infusion of new blood, it's like being reborn. Because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're getting, uh, in a sense, new oxy a new oxygen supply. Mm -hmm. And so it's like night and day. When a person is going down, you can see this, and if they get a transfusion. So that's one of the major ways in which it's treated. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are all sorts of drugs that we uh, can treat um, uh, individuals in pain. Mm -hmm. And I won't get into the details of these, but some of them carry, with, uh, carry all sorts of risks. Um, because they have to have these drugs um, for the pain without which they really literally could not live, they get labeled as um, drug seeking as drug seekers. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, it's 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 really difficult. One of the things we've been able to do this year in in an advoca advocacy way is to uh, participate in a program called the Patient Voice. And what we've done is to bring patients who have had, uh, a, an experience, in, in some cases positive, in some cases negative, with the emergency or the er emergency department, what we've done is to bring those individuals uh, together with the emergency department people to undergo a kind of educational process, mm -hmm. an exchange where they begin to understand and know each other. Uh, and it's not only just the emergency department. Uh, they go to the pharmacy for their drugs, and of course, uh, there are pharmacists that are looking at them in some cases. So there, there needs to be a great deal of education about the sickle cell patient who is uh, in, in need of, of, of these drugs, and sometimes they are opiates and, and many of the so-called dangerous drugs. Mm -hmm. and yes, uh, I'm, and I'm not pointing the finger at the health care providers or the system. Uh, there are people who do abuse mm -hmm of the system, but for the most part, we don't think that is the case for uh, most of the sickle cell patients. Mm -hmm. So we try to make sure that they all are educated, that they all understand each other, and that there's more dialogue. 
and we need to have this around the country. And of course, this was a national uh, voice that uh, was going around the country. We had participants uh, from all over, uh, mm -hmm. from New England to California and, and back into this area, uh, South Carolina. We had people everywhere who were uh, involved. These are people who actually run emergency departments mm -hmm. and hospitals around the country. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you um, are talking about patients being labeled. Because I've actually seen it firsthand where some of my um, colleagues have tried to label sickle cell patients as drug seeking. No, have you ever had a crisis before? If we you've never had a crisis before, don't try to judge. It, let me tell you, they better be seeking. Well, right, exactly, because <laughs> you're not thinking seek, I'm worried about you yeah. and your mental health. <laughs> These are people who are really in dire need of relief from pain. Exactly. And I mean, as you said, there are so many different medicines. They're not necessarily narcotics. Um, sometimes if it's a um, uh, mild form of the pain, they can get away with some um, ibuprofen mm -hmm. or yes. you know, non-steroidal. Um, but for the most part, most of the time, they require some heavier drugs. And it's OK. Yes. But uh, as we say, there, there are uh, some of these drugs have, have really had a tremendously negative impact mm -hmm. on the lives of not only sickle cell people, but uh, people in all, of all walks of life. So you really still have to be careful of these drugs. One of the things that we did in an advocacy uh, fashion was to uh, work with the, the Georgia legislature in the passage of a bill um, that uh, allows for the use of medical uh, cannabis uh, to help uh, to augment uh, the pain of these uh, this mm -hmm. this disease or these diseases, and, and while there are still I mean many states are there they're probably on the order of forty states in the country that have passed legislation whereby an individual can make uh, use of the medical cannabis in one way or another. In this state, it turns out that it's medical cannabis oils. Mm -hmm. um, there's still uh, you know a need uh, to to do clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Uh, on medical cannabis oils. Uh, I mean, if we're going to do it the right way, the way this country does, we look at a drug very mm -hmm. closely, and it goes through trials mm -hmm. before we actually uh, uh, release it to the market and, and people have it. But one of the ways to get the drug to people who need it is to do clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are looking into the possibility of doing uh, clinical trials even uh, through the foundation mm -hmm. Uh, because it's something that you can get the you can get the drug to the individuals and they mm -hmm. can get relief. So, how successful are you getting people into trials? Because you know, um, especially in the African American uh, community, we're not as trustful well, of I mean, trials the, yeah. for obvious reasons. Tuskegee experiment. So, yeah, yes. <laughs> how do you? dispel that and get people into the trial so that we can find out more information about treatment options. Well, it, with respect to the, the, the medical marijuana uh, situation, of course, the, in the drug, there's, there's nothing that would uh, put you in that euphoric state. So this is not about getting high, in other mm -hmm. words. Uh, this drug is just going to simply help you uh, relieve the pain. But there are all the negative con connotations that have uh, come forth and always been there with respect respect to, mm -hmm. to medical marijuana. So, uh, but on the other hand, I will say that there are people who already use uh, marijuana and are, are making uh, use of it in such a way that it does a lot of good for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we would rather they, that they did uh, the medical marijuana because it doesn't uh, put you in that euphoric state. And of course, euphoric, euphoria can lead to other kinds of problems. I mean, driving and all sorts of things. So mm -hmm. we, we'd rather do it by the books and by the law and uh, in clinical trials. And we, ha we expect to have them. And of course, there's still the, the problem of the actual movement of, of the, the, the drug into the state because there's still a federal law in place that doesn't allow you to move it from state. And if it's not being uh, done, or if it's not being prepared in your state or uh, not being uh, manufactured or in your state, um, there's no process for doing You can't bring it across lines mm -hmm. without not uh, violating, anyway, not, yeah. without breaking the federal law. So there are still some, some hurdles uh, to be overcome, it, it'll take a little time. But, you know, I, I've always realized that when the people want something, 
when they really want something, they'll have they'll it. They'll get it. They'll get it. <laughs> However and, they and get I, it. <laughs> I, but, but I mean, and I, I do mean that within the law. I'm not talking about against the law. If they want it within the law, they'll they make it They're going to get it. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So um, we touched on some things um, about managing pain. Um, but, you know, the key is to be proactive, and the key is to try to prevent complications before they happen. Yeah. So what are some of the ways that you can prevent having a complication? Well, now, if I knew that, I, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it might be worth some... How well, about quit smoking? Well, oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it, smoking is uh, smoking is absolutely... Uh, n- no one should be smoking anything like that or any kind of a cigarette or tobacco. Mm-hmm. That is, it, that's an absolute, you you want to get sick, smoke. Exactly, it, and the reason it, is yeah. because smoking cuts off the oxygen supply anyway. So if yes. you already have sickle cell disease where you have your oxygen supply being cut off anyway, why would you add something else it, it, such it, as smoking to the mix? It constricts vessels. So, and you can almost tell a smoker in most cases, at least a long-term smoker, you can tell it by the lines mm-hmm. because they've lost circulation in those mm-hmm. areas and there's been no no oxygen in mm-hmm. those areas so you don't want to do that absolutely you, you, it's certainly hydration we've been you know mm-hmm. we've been hydrating ourselves mm-hmm. and uh, there there are there are times of the year uh, that that seem to be the times that uh, uh, people go undergo their, their their difficulty they go into crisis more more often and so uh, knowing your cycle is always important uh, knowing some of the triggers we we know that stress can trigger things uh, we know that uh, like i say dehydration can certainly trigger things mm-hmm. uh, we, um, we 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 want to see if we can free people of, of, of as much of that as possible mm-hmm. i actually saw a, a an invention and i i don't want to you know talk about an invention but there there's something uh, there's a machine that actually can actually warm your blood in your body mm-hmm. and you simply have to put your your hand in this machine and I actually had it uh, w- w- I, I, I tried the machine out mm-hmm. and I tried it because I had a, a, a painful toe and believe me for three days I was without pain mm-hmm. so there is something to the fact that you may need to not get cold mm-hmm. and you may mm-hmm. keep keep yourself warm mm-hmm. and you you know the first thing that uh, you know most sickle cell patients when they're about to go or in a crisis the first thing you can do is put a blanket on them okay exactly. just, just put a blanket on them right away mm-hmm. because they in, invariably need it yeah warm heating pads and yes. warm baths Absolutely. you know Absolutely. definitely help if you don't have um, a machine or um any kind of warm, you know, compresses, uh, that always helps as well. Of course, you don't want to push it. If you feel th- that you're really going into serious crisis, I mean, you don't even have to really think about serious crisis. Mm-hmm. You really need to utilize the healthcare system, and there's a great comprehensive healthcare uh, sickle cell center there, which is uh, actually the first uh, in the country. Uh, that is still a facility that uh, can help a great deal. Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure that you do get in information right away from the right people, your 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 physician, your 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 hematologist, uh, the the radius center. You want to do everything that you can, again, to ward off and to prevent the onset mm-hmm. of, um, of a crisis. Mm-hmm. And along the lines of staying well hydrated, because um, all of our tissues need to stay well hydrated, yeah. you need to avoid alcohol. Absolutely. Because alcohol, you get dehydrated, right? Abs- absolutely. It's a dehydrator all the way. All the way around. <laughs> we, we, we can't, we, we've, we've known that for a long time, and so we like to make sure that uh, the sickle cell patient uh, be really aware of that you have to really, really limit, if not uh, discourage alcohol Mm -hmm. altogether. Exactly. Um, Also, when you're traveling by air, you need to avoid certain things in the air, right? Well, actually, that uh, is something that even the the, the sickle cell trait individual uh, Mm -hmm. has to be careful (laughs) about um, height. I mean, when I say height, I mean mean elevation is really what I'm talking about, about sea level. I mean, when you get into a plane and a decompression uh, plane, you actually, I guess, in a sense, we're all taking our chances up there. But that is a, an environment that sometimes can cause the uh, the individual with the trait to actually sickle as well. So mm-hmm. even though the sickle cell trait individual does not have the disease, there are conditions 
under which they can have their blood sickled. Mm -hmm. And of course, mountain climbing and things that take you into higher elevations can have a negative impact on that. Absolutely, I can mm -hmm. actually attest to that because mm -hmm. as I alluded to, I am a world traveler. And one of the things I hate is to use the bathroom on the plane. And so one of the ways to do that is not drink, right? That's right. But I have to. Have to and drink. I know that because when I dehydrate myself and I actually um, um, end up going um, to urinate, my urine is so concentrated. Mm -hmm. And it's because the cells are sickling trying to pass my urine. Fortunately, you don't have as many of the cells sickling mm -hmm. that, uh, as someone who actually has actually the, the disease. Exactly, yes. mm -hmm. exactly. So stay hydrated. Also, we got to take care of the eyes. Oh, the eyes are very important. Uh, anything that um, de dehydrates, uh, you, you actually have, you can al almost tell in some cases, when an individual has sickle cell disease, mm -hmm. by looking at the eyes, they become mm -hmm. jaundiced. And mm -hmm. so uh, you want to make sure that your eyes are, are protected, make mm -hmm. sure that your eyes are kept from being dry. Mm -hmm. you, wanna, you, wanna, you may have to use little tear um, products to, to help in that mm -hmm. regard. And see an ophthalmologist. Oh, yes. At absolutely. least once a year? Yes. You're, you're in, and in fact, your primary care physician mm -hmm. It needs to make sure you need. You may, in some cases, have to tell your primary care physician, "Do I need? Do I need to do this?" Because, you know, primary care physicians have just so long with in this in this healthcare system that we're in now. So you have to make sure you have to really become mm -hmm. attuned to what's going on with mm -hmm. respect to this disease. There's no excuse. You have to know more than the. You you have to know as much as the doctor knows about if your not disease. more if not more absolutely yeah. and your peculiar situation your particular situation is is different from anybody else's so mm -hmm. you need to make sure that the doctor is aware of your specific situation mm -hmm. your specific need for care absolutely yeah. once again be proactive know your body yeah you have to you really and of course this this happens to be the case for families when they have a child with sickle mm -hmm. cell. Uh, we 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 really have to. You have to become an advocate for your child. Without which, your child, you know, may not get quite the care that uh, it deserves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, is there a cure for sickle cell at this point? Well, several hundred people actually have been cured of the disease as a result of uh, bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, there is going to be a lot of genetic therapies and. Um, the bone marrow transplant, first of all, is it, it is not something that is going to work for everybody. That's the mm -hmm. first thing I should say. And that doesn't mean that you they don't want to give you a bone marrow transplant. But the, mm -hmm. the older you are, the less likely that they will they will do a, a bone marrow mm -hmm. transplant on you. Uh, because there's been so much damage over a period of time. By the time you're 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 an adult, you you've actually been through many crises. You've been mm -hmm. sick for your life, and so uh, these situations won't work quite as well for you. It's also a very expensive operation. It may cost you know I, I'm looking at the figures lately could cost up to half a million dollars. It takes place over a long period of time. There are all sorts of associated risks with it. Um, you know the the transplants just don't always work. You need a match. Uh, in most cases, you need a match. They're now trying them without the match, um, and in some cases, they've worked. You mm -hmm. can actually do some things with the uh, the the, st the cells themselves mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to change the cell in such a way that it it, it is a better match. Mm -hmm. Let me put it that way. Absolutely. Can you talk about briefly the um, the initiative that the uh, NIH, the National Institute of Health? Um, is coming out with the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative. Can you just give us a brief um, description of that? Yes. Um, let me just say that um, the National Institutes of Health in this country is the premier uh, research uh, entity of, mm -hmm. the, of the United States and mm -hmm. the government. Uh, it has many different institutes that are, there's a National Cancer Institute, and you'll hear that very often, there's a National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, out of which this particular initiative begins. Mm -hmm. And so it's really an effort on the part of the research infrastructure to mm -hmm. come together and to concentrate all of its resources mm -hmm. in a kind of, 
I hate to compare it to a man on the moon kind of thing, but it is. It's it's a a, a race to the cure. Mm. That's really what it is. Right. And when I say race, it really is a race to the cure. It's colleges and universities where they're doing research. Mm -hmm. It's venture capital situations. It's mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical companies. It's the government. Everybody now, instead of being in a race, are going to kind of come together and do that race together mm -hmm. to con concert, have a concerted uh, effort to bring all of the resources together to actually find a cure. And I think this is really foreseeable, a foreseeable goal uh, in the next five to 10 years, because if you look at the, the simple, the simplistic mutation that takes place that brings on this disease, it just seems very intuitive that we could edit out the mistake and insert the proper, uh, I would call it just the, the proper block. Seems simple it enough, huh? It, it seems simple <laughs> enough. And when you think about, you know, we diagnosed mm -hmm. this, this disease, not really diagnosed it, but mm -hmm. found, about, found out th that this disease was um, here in this country as, as long as 1910 mm -hmm. ago. I mean, it was 1910 when they first saw the, saw the first case of this. They didn't know what they were looking at at the time. And, of course, this disease has really taught it really has been a, a, a teaching disease about disease. In fact, this is the disease that first made us realize that disease is a, molec a molecular process. Yeah. And uh, there have been Nobel Prizes given for the research done in, on this disease. Still, we do not have the actual cure for the disease mm -hmm. itself. We have a technique that lends itself to remedy and it may, as I say, that may be just one of the many things that will occur because there's so many different forms of the disease as individuals are different. Mm -hmm. If you look at our DNA, we differ by no more than a tenth of one percent if you take the two most diverse people on the earth. Mm -hmm. But that tenth of one percent is three million nucleotides, mm -hmm. and I, those are the building blocks that we talk about. So there's the opportunity for all of the variation and differences that we see in eye color, hair color, mm -hmm. skin color, uh, behavior, uh, all of those things so that we are, in, in disease works the same way. Mm -hmm. We are different uh, depending upon, you know, we're all different. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thanks for um, the discussion. Any parting words you would have for Yes, we, we just want to make sure that uh, people are aware of the fact that this is um, Sickle Cell Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. uh, we encourage you to go on our website uh, to help us in ways that you can help us. We need volunteers for the various events that we do. The other day we did a very nice uh, Sickle Cell Walk, and we had a little over 300 people to come out and walk for sickle cell. Uh, we do fundraisers to help uh, and all of those uh, efforts. You can simply make a donation or you can come in and do something that gives your time and effort uh, to this, uh, this, this disease. So we, we encourage you to, to help us in any way that you can. Well, on that note, um, I want to thank you for coming and shedding some more light on um, such a very important topic. And um, if you have not learned anything from this, know your status. Absolutely. I want to leave you with this. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for the righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Once again, you've been listening to Health Tips with the nation's bedside doctor. I am Dr. Tammy Prince. Thank you so much for tuning in.